live. Yo, we are back. I am back after quite the hiatus uh, and excited to run through this week's Fed Watch. Uh, we are getting up there, getting close to 100 episodes of Fed Watch. Uh, so pretty exciting. Uh, Ansel's pretty much done every single one of them. I've been on most of them. Uh, and we have quite the show for you all today. What's up, Ansel? Oh, not much. Just uh, come back from a long weekend. And I think I started around Fed 25. So I've only been here for seven, uh, about 75 episodes. All right. Well, uh, maybe it was sooner than that. I don't know. <laughs> we're, we're, we're crunching towards towards 100. So I'm excited. It's yep, been yep. a joint effort. And uh, I got to give a shout out to uh, the live stream crew and our producer, Chris. Thanks for joining this effort and helping us put this show on every single week. Um, Ansel. We got a jam-packed show. What are we talking about? Yeah, so I thought we could just talk a little bit about Bitcoin and what our feelings are about the price right now and about the market, because I don't think that, you know, price is reflecting the fundamentals. And I, I kind of have my head down a little bit in the macro side of things and uh, don't, you know, any more these days, I, I don't uh, follow the news cycle in Bitcoin as much as I should, uh, but that's where you guys uh, on Bitcoin Magazine really, uh, you know, uh, excel. So I was wanting to pick your guys' brain about kind of what you guys see in the news cycle uh, and is it slowly starting to match fundamentals out there? You know, I, I guess if I could just give my commentary, no way. Bitcoin's fundamentals are incredible and uh, we haven't seen anything yet. I guess we see Bitcoin rallying with the NASDAQ a little bit. We're seeing altcoins not. So there's a little bit of this decoupling, but uh, I think it's way too early to tell. And ultimately, I'm so bullish on Bitcoin fundamentals that uh, I, I think we're nowhere close to what the the actual value is. Chris, know, or Q. Chris do, you, do, you, do you want to jump in? I don't know if Q's ready. <laughs> yeah, uh, Q, you there or P? You want to hop in at all? Just uh, the, the question is about um, what what do you guys take uh, make of the, the Bitcoin news cycle? And Christian brought up a good point about um, altcoins and how, you know, I, I've been trying to push that Bitcoin is not crypto and crypto is not Bitcoin. Uh, but there is still in the market, you know, this uh, idea that, Ethereum and others are peers of Bitcoin. And I see some of the fundamentals of Ethereum kind of affecting the price of Bitcoin. Um, do you guys have any comments on that? Yeah, I mean, I said this before, but I think that they are, as you said, totally different things, right? You have Bitcoin, which represents sound money. It's this revolutionary um, innovation in so many different areas. And then you have Ethereum and all the other shit coins. And uh, Ethereum manages to keep relevance in my opinion because it was one of the earlier uh affinity scams that was trying to affinity scam bitcoin and also because as i've said before others have said before ethereum is the anus through which all the shit coins are shat out into the world and so or, or many of them and so that is uh, a factor that keeps it you know seemingly relevant but i think that uh as much as I hate to say it, I think that even though, you know, Ethereum has gotten and everything else has gotten totally wrecked, way more wrecked than Bitcoin, you know, these are like ticks on the back of a dog. They just basically uh, come back up as soon as the price of Bitcoin starts going up again. And I don't think we're ever going to see um, scams in any area, but certainly not in Bitcoin, ever go away completely. Um, but I think that uh, in terms of sort of news cycle and hype and everything, uh, I mean, Bitcoin Twitter has certainly died down. Uh, a lot of people who are usually very vocal uh, have died down. I think that's a great thing. I think that in bear markets, uh, you know, all the actual work gets done. And uh, in bull markets, it's when you have to deal with a ton of noise and just background garbage. So I'm happy. But uh, yeah, I'll agree. I mean, I guess we've seen a little bit of a, a rally lately, I guess the Memorial Day rally in terms of price going up slightly. Uh, I don't want to focus on that, though. I think a lot of assets are still correlated as Ansel. I know we've been talking about this for weeks just with, you know, interest rates rising with we're just kind of watching global economies crumble. I think everyone's kind of waiting for what's going to break. You know, we've Q hounds on this all the time. Like, I think Bitcoin's 
correlated to the NASDAQ at like 0.93, so 93% correlation. Uh, a lot of people think it's going to break correlation. You know, NASDAQ will keep falling, Bitcoin will go up, maybe the reverse will happen. Uh, I'm not one to speculate, but I still think there's a lot of correlation across all assets, across all markets until we have a better understanding of uh, what's to come, basically. Okay. I want to throw this theory out and then I'm going to go back to reading my book quietly and let you guys actually talk. But it has been a very fruitful and very lucrative trade to use the Bitcoin price action and movement to essentially help me forward forecast QQQ puts and calls. And it has actually become very lucrative to treat it like on a two week trailing, sometimes less than two week trailing basis. And like, for example, that dip that we saw two weeks ago when Bitcoin went like to 26k but nasdaq kind of like held there well guess what happened about 10 days later it undercut that low from the day when everyone thought oh it's hyper correlated it's like no bitcoin is the leading indicator right now that's the way i've been trading it i've been making some good money doing it that's my two cents on the correlation all right q maybe one thing before you go away aren't you just basically correlating it to volatility then you're basically just using bitcoin as like a leading volatility index for the index i mean i, I don't know if you've tried correlating bitcoin yeah. the volatility index and the qqq you you get away with it and it, it essentially is that the real reason why i think this works well for right now is because it's a 24-hour market so like whereas you get like the price gets locked for longer than the price is actually active in the publicly traded markets. Whereas with Bitcoin, because it's available 24 seven, you can get a, a much cleaner, in my opinion, price forecasting tool. And like, whether or not you agree with this, I am fully in the camp that Bitcoin for the time being is just a risk on asset by big money managers and big funds. And that's why you see this correlation. Well, that correlation for them happens instantaneously while the correlation in the public markets takes time to unwind and unload so i think that is really what you're seeing and causing the delay slash correlation between the two markets look i think i'm an expert I, i'm not i like to think i am so take it with the greatest salt use your own tools to actually gauge and measure this but i think there are weird opportunities like treating the Bitcoin as some sort of a leading indicator to the NASDAQ that you can take advantage of. But that's just my two cents. Well, uh, one of my narratives I'm pushing is that Bitcoin is actually a superior pricing tool in the long run. So uh, that would be an example of uh, how, how Bitcoin is even today leaving and in, in, in creating uh, opportunities to get better pricing signals. So uh, I think it's bullish. Uh, and Q, I think a lot of what you said is probably accurate. I'm curious what, what Ansel has to say. Yeah, I think it makes sense. Um, I remember a couple of years ago, people were talking about Bitcoin being a leading indicator um, by weeks or months even uh, to the broader markets. I think that probably still holds th true because Bitcoin is more volatile, right? So Bitcoin can change on a dime where it might take a little bit more to move the inertia, say, of the stock markets. But um yeah, I interesting correlation talking about correlation because yeah, I'm a I'm actually not a S&P or a stock bear at this point. Um I think that we probably won't see all-time highs anytime soon, but I also don't think we're going to see massive sell-offs just because of the way capital is going to be fleeing other parts of the world and probably going into dollar denominated assets. So, um I think that's good for Bitcoin. It's also good for U.S. stocks. But um, yeah, I, I, we could go on further or we can just jump into the inflation numbers that I had uh, prepared on the slides. What do you guys think? Yeah, no. So uh, let, let, let's let's let Q get back to his book. Let's jump into the <laughs> slides. Um, we got international inflation numbers. So, you know, what we're always doing here is uh, is keeping y'all up to date with what's happening in macro with the Fed globally. Um, so, you know, we have Germany, the Eurozone in general, uh, and, you know, just going to get into these numbers. And Q, I'm not making fun of you, man. You know, just <laughs> we, we got to get on with the show. Yeah, well, that was good for me because I, I want to have my finger on the pulse. And I think uh, over the last couple months, it's been kind of depressing to 
keep in the Bitcoin news cycle. So you guys are a lot of my signal out there. So I appreciate that. Now, um, yeah, getting on to these inflation numbers is well, the first slide here I have, uh, Chris, you haven't pulled up. Okay. Um, so first one is this German CPI. It printed today and it's the highest in 60 years. It's actually the, the tied for the highest in 70 years, going all the way back to 1950. Uh, so this is a pretty significant rise, as you can see on this chart. Uh, G Germany is very sensitive to inflation because they still have cultural memory of the Weimar Republic hyperinflation back in the 20s that led to a rise of populism and, and bad things over there in Germany. So, um, you know, they they really hate this. Uh, I'm sure that it's, it's going to make some dramatic political changes uh, over there in Germany. And Germany is above average for the Eurozone. So going to slide two, the Eurozone inflation preliminary numbers uh, for May were released this morning as well. And they are above expectation by a pretty significant amount. So the expectation was 7.8% and they are all the way up at 8.1%. So the Eurozone kind of seems they haven't peaked in, in, in inflation like the US has, which we'll get into here in a second. They almost look like they're three to six months behind uh, where the US economy is. And then taking this into uh, slide number three, uh, the PCE was released uh, in the last week, and uh, this is for April. So the PCE comes out at the end of the month, where the CPI comes out at the beginning of the month. Both of them, you know, obviously are for the prior month. So the April's number of PCE just came out, and this was people were talking about this could be behind uh, the stock market rally that we saw when Bitcoin was decoupling a little bit from the stock market um, last week because of this PCI number that, or PCE number that came out. Um, as you can see on the screen here, the month over month, or sorry, the year over year for the core PCE fell to 4.9%. And if you look at the month over month number, it's actually the fourth month in a row of slowing PCE. Uh, that is significant. This, it's also the Fed's preferred measurement. So they do look at the CPI, of course, but they look closely at this PCE and I think it carries more weight for them. So we see the fourth month in a row where PCE has slowed and the second month in a row where the year over year PCE has decreased. Uh, the next slide, slide number four, is the US CPI month over month. And this is one thing that I've been looking at more often because I think there's a lot of fudge room within a hey, really year. quick yep. before we switch to the next slide can we can we actually go back to the PCE slide and can you just clarify a little bit what is yeah. PECE and how like how did what's its relationship to CPI um well it's it's just a different measure with different weights I'm not exactly sure the um exact way that it differs from CPI but this is a more of a uh, deeper economic number than looking at consumer prices. This could be looking at pr pr producer prices and different prices in the economy. So it's kind of a, a deeper look at the state of uh, prices uh, in the economy than a CPI would. Does that make sense? Like CPI is more surface level and PCE is more a depth look. Like how is, is the PCE used in kind of determining policy or anything like that uh, from, you know, a uh, Fed perspective? Um, well, when they look at inflation um, and they talk about fighting inflation, they are looking more at PCE. So if PCE starts, like if you look at this chart up here, it peaked in February where the CPI peaked in March. So when the Fed is looking at their decisions, whatever they're going to do. Um, if PCE and CPI are divergent, you know, what we should be considering in Fed policy is PCE and not CPI. Gotcha. Okay. Makes sense. Sorry, we can go to the next slide now. <laughs> Thanks. All right. So the, the next slide here is the month over month number. And uh, like I said, this is what I look at more often now because there can be a lot of, um, well, the year over year number that we're familiar with, you know, like 8.5% that we had back in April, um, there can be a lot of stuff hidden within that. Like if the inflation was 
a lot during the beginning of that year and less so at the end of that year, you can't really get a lot of nuance from the year over year number. So I like this month over month number. And what we see here is that uh, it has fallen to its lowest level since back in January of 2021. And I expect this to possibly stay this low uh, down at 0.3% month over month, which will then in turn have a big impact on the year over year change. So uh, I'm just trying to show this because a lot of, a lot of people ragged on the word transitory, you know, but if this actually happens and we see a CPI really coming down over the next uh, three to six months. I don't understand how people can't say, oh yeah, that was transitory. And the Fed was right all along. They just retired that term because we refuse to understand what they're trying to say. So uh, any comments on that, the whole conversation on uh, CPI and inflation and stuff? So, I mean, are, do you think that the tightening of a monetary policy is, is causing this? No, I think this is natural market moves. Uh, you know, the the market goes in its own patterns and own cycles. Uh, one reason why I think the Fed has really been hawkish is not because, well, you know, most macro pundits out there, they say, oh, the Fed is doing this. The Fed is tightening. Uh, can the Fed actually do this with everyone screaming about um, recession, recession? Can they keep raising rates? I don't look at it that way. I see the Fed as follower. They will follow where the market leads. They they are just trying to shepherd to a soft landing, you know, and a quick recovery. They don't actually uh, directly impact any of these type of type of numbers. So when I see the CPI um, and it's turning down, um, I think that what the Fed did was they saw a sharp deceleration in the middle of 2022, and they wanted to get out ahead of that because if it was if it decelerated, if the economy decelerated while they were still doing QE, like their confidence, confidence in the Fed would have been trash and they wouldn't have been able to shepherd the market to a soft landing. So they, uh, they had to get out ahead of this downturn. Now that, it is, uh, now that the economy is turning over and which we'll show in some of these other macro charts that I have lined up, um, as the market is turning over, now the Fed can repivot their narrative because it's all about a narrative and uh, keeping confidence in the Fed. Makes sense. No, and I I, I agree. Uh, again, uh, that's been the message that we've been talking about on this show. Uh, it's been a message that a lot of our guests have iterated, but yet it really is kind of like a uh, a outside an outsider's opinion it's not popular yet but i do find this kind of understanding to be catching steam and again i'd like to you know give ansel a shout out you have been you have been on this tirade for pretty much the entirety of this show i think you know all of our past 94 episodes uh can can be a nice proof of that but um it, it is this this narr- this uh, understanding that the fed just controls expectations and the narrative and that is their, their true policy power, like that, that is becoming a much more widely accepted idea, despite the fact that it's still uh, not a popular opinion, even amongst the people who are like, kind of with the counter narrative, if you will. Oh, yeah, for sure. Like we had Tom Luongo on a couple episodes ago, and he is very closely related to my outlook, at least on like geopolitics and stuff. But he view, he thinks that the Fed will keep raising, keep raising, keep raising. But I don't understand how they could do that if they don't control the market. You know, why would they keep raising if the market, uh, you know, all the market rates for U.S. treasuries and stuff are coming back down and the Fed raises the Fed funds rate and it absolutely does nothing. It just exposes that they are impotent to the market. Well, how could that you know, build confidence in the Fed. I think that's exactly the opposite of what they want. They want, they wanted, uh, Powell wanted to get out ahead of this. So they now have room to pivot. And I think that they will pivot. Um, and that will, it could be as easy as just pausing at this point. And that would be a huge updraft to risk assets of all types, including Bitcoin and stocks. So um, I see that coming in the middle of this year, in the next few months, actually, I think they will pause. Wow. Okay. So 
uh, they're watching the PCE, they're watching the CPI, they're seeing these things go down. Uh, and if they continue to go down over the next few months, the next quarter, um, you think that odds are is they will slow down the tightening, they will respond to the market's agony, if you will. Uh, and, and that is very bullish for risk on assets. Yeah, I mean, the Fed doesn't, oh, sorry, I hit my mic. Um, the Fed does not want to crush the economy. The Fed wants to be seen as great shepherds of the economy. And so they are not going to do anything to uh, run it into the ground. I, I, don't, I don't understand that. Um, okay, and the next section I have here is on currencies. Should we dive into that? Bitcoin, of course, is the headline number, and that will be slide number five. So what I'm showing here is if you go, it's a, a little bit over a year on the daily chart. So it's a little bit busy, but if you go to the far right, you can see where we have broken out of this kind of bottoming pattern and we have bullish divergences in my two favorite indicators, which are just basic. But you know, I always say that RSI and MACD, they are what everything else is built off of, all these other fancy indicators. So um, anyways, we have a. Can you explain what RSI and MACD are for people who aren't familiar with technical analysis? Oh man. Um, okay, so RSI is relative <laughs> strength. Making you work, Ansel. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I don't know if I can do this uh, expertly, but um, relative strength index RSI is uh, built off of volume. So, like the direction of the candle and volume. The higher the volume, the more it actually moves in that direction with the color of the candle. Uh, then there's oversold and overbought conditions. So if it has moved a lot in one direction and you go below 30 on the RSI, that's considered oversold. If you go above 70, that's considered overbought. So you can kind of uh, you know, stay in that band that that would be a healthy market. Now, when you have a divergence means that your price has actually gone down but the relative strength has gone the other direction. So you see on this chart here, the relative strength has trended upwards, even though the price has trended downwards. So that is a divergence and it means that there could be a reversal coming. It doesn't always work, but it's, it's pretty good, especially if you have it on multiple timeframes. Now the MACD, I'm not the one to explain this. I think it has to do with um, the moving averages. I think it's like a seven day and a 14 day or a 14 day and a 21 uh, day, something like that. Uh, but again, you have these divergences where the MACD just recently is trending up, even though the price is trending down. So that is uh, divergence. Now on the left side of the screen here, you see the peak that I circled. That was a very similar situation to today. And that actually coincided with the Bitcoin 2021 conference. If you guys remember back June of 2021, um, we had a pattern with a divergence and we broke out, but then it quickly reversed. Um, so we could be looking at something like that, but the difference back then versus today is that was back with the GBTC scandal, the all the unlocking that was happening with GBTC. And there was a lot of uncertainty and bearishness around that event. So right now, I, I don't see that kind of fundamental force, selling force in the Bitcoin market. So um, I don't think we're going to see a repeat of June of 2021, but I just wanted to point out that kind of similarity to what we saw back then. Do you guys have, uh, Christian, do you have any comments on the chart before we move on? You're I don't have anything super smart to say. Um, it is interesting to learn about these indicators and kind of see how they correlate with price, but... Um, you know, I feel like right now investors are really kind of leaning into and listening in on what the Fed is going to do and kind of, you know, maybe that is just the noise that's drowning out the real signal. But, um, you know, I, I just, you know, I, I can't see, you know, what matters more than, than the expectations from the market, at least from that perspective. I want to ask, and Ansel, forgive me if this is going to be one of the future charts, but on last week's Bitcoin and markets, you do. I love the chart that you always include with like the volume on the side, so you can see, uh, yeah, like where how much volume was buying at a certain price level. Uh, like I've been very vocal about this. 
this 28,000 line that we're seeing at the bottom of this current chart, the Bitcoin price chart that you're seeing. Like what validity are you seeing to 28K being held based on how long we've been and how much volume that you're seeing transact at that price level? And yes, Alex McChain is literally coming back onto this show to scold me for bringing up 28K, but it stands true <laughs> to this day. <laughs> I actually like the 28K number. I've been, I've been tracking that. Yeah, I think, uh, well, if you look at the volume by price, that's that indicator that shows a horizontal volume instead of a volume below per candle. It shows volume per price, right? So there's, there's a um, volume indicator that's on, on the right-hand side of the chart. That is actually showing there is massive resistance above the current price. So 28 does not show really any support for volume by price. There is kind of a gap in that section of the chart from, if we didn't hold 28K, then it would drop pretty dramatically, probably down to 24 and then down to 21 or something. So it's almost like a, a support of last hope or last chance is support would be 28K. And we have so far held it. So uh, I'm, I'm pretty confident that it will, that that line will hold, uh, but it will be a tough slog to get through the price from roughly 32, 33,000 up to 40, there is a lot of volume resistance in that band. So it, it will be kind of hard to get through that. Uh, it could act as resistance, you know, and push the price back down, but we will have to see about that. Um, no, you know, on the bearish side of things, uh, if we stay sideways for a long time, I get bearish on, on that, that holding that 28K. Um, historically, if we grind at a number for a really long time, at some point, the market falls out from under us. Um, so I'm really hoping that, you know, the Fed pivots, whatever happens, and, you know, we can defend the line for a few more months and, and bounce back because otherwise, you know, like Ansel and Q have mentioned multiple times, there's not a whole lot between, you know, 28K and, and 20K. All right. Well, uh, let's move on to the dollar. This, this, I have a couple more currencies here. So this is slide number six, and I will include this in the in the write-up and in the show notes for the podcast. Uh, wherever you guys are listening to this, you should be able to see um, or at least find a link to these slides. Now, this DXY, I zoomed it out here to include about seven years. Um, and what I was trying to do was show that how uh, the dollar went from a lower kind of uh, range between 70 and 90. And then it jumped into a new range between roughly 90 and 100 that we've been in for the last seven years. And we just recently broke a previous high, like a multi-decade high. And so I think we're going to reprice uh, the dollar to a new range that's going to be between 100 and 110, roughly. And uh, so I, on the left-hand side, I kind of showed a square of what I think might be coming up over the next couple of months is a consolidation in the dollar before it goes uh, higher again. But I've been predicting a stronger dollar pretty much all of 2021 and even 2020 during the when it was coming down. But uh, you know, I am I'm still predicting a stronger dollar from here, and that is not necessarily Bitcoin bearish. Many people say you know the Bitcoin is a hedge against inflation, and so the dollar has to actually go down. But that's not the case, right? Um, a stronger dollar means that there is a flight to liquidity. There is a rush towards uh, money and towards cash. And so Bitcoin being digital cash will benefit from a stronger dollar or the same conditions that make a stronger dollar. Bitcoin should and could benefit from that. So um, that's what I'm seeing on the dollar. A lot of people don't like the DXY. So if we go to the next slide, uh, you can see this is a trade weighted dollar. And this is what the Fed puts out. And they, uh, so instead of the DXY being only mainly the euro and the yen and a little bit, uh, like 10% of the pound in there with the DXY, uh, the trade weighted dollar has over 30 currencies, importantly, including the Chinese renminbi and the Mexican peso. So th this is more a very broad measure of the dollar. And what you see is we do see uh, uh, over on the far right of the chart, a little bit of consolidation as well on the trade weighted dollar. But if we take that level 120 and we look, go all the way to the left, 
we're still at higher rates other than the, you know, really uh, hardcore depths of the Corona crash. We are at higher rates than that the trade weighted dollar has been in a very long time. So this also shows a strengthening dollar, but one, a strengthening dollar perhaps in consolidation. So um, I'm kind of expecting a consolidation in the dollar over the next couple months. Uh, any comments on the dollar before I move on to the Euro? Well, so I guess really quick, explain what a consolidation in the dollar looks like. You know, what does that mean? Um, and uh, I guess, you know, what, what, what are the implications? Yeah, so consolidation, um, I use it as a, like basically a term that says, oh, we've gone a long distance. We need to kind of take a breather before we continue on in that trend. So we don't see a change in trend. We just see kind of a consolidation in price. So I think that the dollar will continue to strengthen, but it can't go up all at one time. Uh, as the dollar strengthens, you know, there's a lot of uh, uh, pressure in the market, uh, in credit markets and things. So you need time for people to file bankruptcy. You need time for people to default or even refinance, rollover loans, whatever they need to do. And so that kind of creates this natural timing where uh, after a advance, then there's a consolidation and then there's a continue on the trend. So that's what I think is going to happen in the dollar. All right, let's jump to the euro. All right. So this is slide number eight, and you can see the red line goes back two decades, back to 2020. And this was a support line and it has broken last month. Um, it fell pretty dramatically um, down to 104. It has caught a little bounce here. And if we juxtapose this with the dollar, uh, I think uh, we are looking at a consolidation as well in the euro, but it's not going to be a reversal. I think that we have, you know, or the euro ha uh, has many more headwinds than the dollar does. So uh, I think the, the euro will continue to weaken after a period of consolidation. I'm just kind of showing this chart to match with the DXY. So this is kind of the inverse of the DXY. If we go to the next slide, it's the Hong Kong dollar. And the chart on the left is just showing this range where they are, you know, they have a peg for the Hong Kong dollar to dollar. And it's between 7.75 and 7.85. And you can see it kind of fluctuates in there. When it's at the high end of the range, which it has been over the last couple of weeks, uh, this, to me, uh, symbolizes that there is a uh, dollar shortage in the world and dollar strength is affecting um, a lot of the Far East markets. That would be China, Taiwan, uh, South Korea, Japan, Singapore, those type of places. There is a uh, dollar pressure over there. And then on the right is just a daily chart and you can see how it has bumped right up there against that peg. It has a little bit of room right now. I think it's down... I can't really see that number, but I think it's a 7.83 or something like that. So there's a little bit of room there, but um, uh, yeah, this, this is sim sim symbolizing that there is pressure in the currency markets and a flight to the dollar. Um, any comments on that, Christian? So what happens if this peg gets broken? Oh man, well, they, so the way they uh, protect the peg is they go out in the market and they will sell dollars. So they have to have dollar reserves, right? They sell dollars and buy Hong Kong dollars. If they run out of dollars to sell, that's a problem. That means it will be uncontrolled and the peg will break just very, <laughs> it won't be as dramatic as like a Terra Luna peg breaking, but uh, it could be pretty dramatic. I mean, we could see it jump to eight and a half or something like that relatively quickly. And that would just be very destructive because a lot of, you know, portfolios and a lot of people's investments and, and all that stuff are built around this peg holding. And if this peg doesn't hold, uh, it could be disastrous, mainly for banks, I would say in the Asian market. So Chinese banks and uh, J Japanese banks, this would be really bad if this broke. Um, does that answer the question? No, totally. And I mean, I I just it's really interesting to see, you know, how the world economy is built on the dollar and all these dollar derivatives like the euro dollar, um, like the Hong Kong dollar, all these kind of things that enable the world to get access to dollars and and how a lot of that is, you know, coming to a head 
uh, with, you know, the limitations of these systems all at the same time. Absolutely. And diving in to a previous currency, you know, the gold, gold standard, I have a gold chart here and that is uh, showing that um, it's been hard to be a gold bug um, f- since 2011. They're still, still under the all time high from back in 2011. Um, even though it did break the all time high a little bit here, it's right now it's under that. So you're, you've been holding gold for 11 years and you have yet to make a new high. Um, I do expect there to be some matching consolidation here, maybe go up a little bit, 10% in the price of gold as the dollar is consolidating and things. Um, but long-term, I am not bearish gold. I'm slightly bullish on gold, but you know, where gold will go up 10%, Bitcoin will go up hundred percent. So um, it's just hard being a gold bug. And I thought I would put this in here for completeness. And that's all I have for currencies. Should we, do we have time to go into commodities or should I make that a separate show or what? No, let's, let's keep it going. We got time. All right. So next slide here. Uh, this is slide 11 and it is WTI versus Brent crude. So WTI is West Texas intermediate. So it's the U S dollar price uh, or price of oil in the United States. And then Brent crude is a UK price. So it's European pretty much it's European oil. And they, they usually track pretty closely. Um, Brent crude is usually about five or 10% higher than WTI crude. Uh, but the reason why I wanted to show this was because of the European sanctions that we saw some headlines for this morning, uh, oil sanctions against Russia. Uh, this is like their sixth round of sanctions or something. It wasn't enough on the first five, they had to do a sixth one. And it turns out that this round of sanctions isn't even that uh, big anyway, because it doesn't touch pipeline oil. Anyway, um, you can see the Brent crude, which is the orange line, um, actually sold off today. So even though they put on new sanctions, the price of Brent crude came down. And uh, so uh, I don't know, I wanted to put this in here to show that uh, the sanctions aren't having the same effect as they once did. uh, And Actually, it went in reverse of what you would expect on the day of sanctions turning on. Uh, some people might say, oh, well, oil, what about natural gas? So the next slide is European natural gas futures. And this is on log scale. So it's, it was pretty bad uh, going into late last year. Uh, it went all the way from 3 euros, uh, 3.65 euros back in 2020, all the way up to 220 euros. So that is a very, very significant, painful, painful rally. Uh, But as you can see, even with the recent sanctions and all of that stuff, price is starting to come down. And uh, over the last few weeks, natural gas futures in Europe have been trickling downward. Uh, I expect that to happen uh, or to continue to happen. So um, that's what I have for energy prices. Yep. Yeah. You know, I was asking you, you know, if all these indicators like CPI and stuff like that are flawed, what do you actually look at? And your answer was oil. So yeah, kind of read the tea leaves here and then we can jump to the next section. I think that's, you know, this is kind of all the time we have for commodities, but I think you know, it would be interesting to get further analysis on what, what does this divergence mean? What does this trickling uh, uh, prices mean in the face of sanctions? What, what is, you know, I guess the market, uh, kind of indicating here. So yeah, um, I should have actually said this up front. My my overall thesis here is that we're we're going to see a lot of demand destruction, and it's going to happen faster than many of the pundits are saying. You know, many of the pundits are saying that inflation will be sticky high, and uh, we'll see stocks selling off in the U.S. and and all that stuff. I'm pretty I'm pretty much taking the opposite uh, control contrarian position on all of these major calls by the the macro pundits out there. I think the dollar is going to continue to strengthen. I think U.S. stocks are are going to do okay. And I think uh, demand destruction is going to hit the cost of oil and natural gas. So as if the economy goes into pretty hard recession pretty quickly, you know, the demand is going to fall a lot faster than supply. And so price will come down. So a lot of these charts are just based around that thesis that, um, Demand is going to fall faster than supply, and we're actually going to see uh, 
prices drop over the next six months. All right. Very, very interesting. It's going to be interesting to the listeners. To, you know, we're going to have to hold Ansel's feet against the fire. I think we brought this up with his bold call a few weeks ago, but he's sticking to it. We're going to have to see if this plays out. Um, Ansel, we got a lot of stuff to talk about around, you know, Biden and the globalists and, you know, the, the Fed dynamics. Are there any charts that you think, you know, are necessary for us to hit on uh, beyond what we have? Uh, if not, let's get into that. Well, um, I put this on the outline to talk about Biden and um, meeting with Powell because really this is the big news out of the Fed this week. Um, I, Other than saying, look, like Tom Luongo would say, this is Wall Street meeting with the globalists. And I tend to agree with that. So um, Biden is upset at uh, Powell because Powell is not helping oil prices. You know, he thinks that Powell should be easing causing oil prices to come down and uh, help the uh, inflation numbers or whatever. And so and there, there's, a, there's a disconnect between the globalists and Wall Street, which is symbolized by this meeting. And that, that's all that I was trying to bring up with this. I don't have any charts to go along with that. Well, so let's get a little bit more into this dynamic, right? So the dynamic that you're talking about is that there are Wall Street interests, there are kind of like European WEF globalist interests, and the Fed is much more aligned with Wall Street's interests. And I guess like tease out that power dynamic, tell us yeah. a little bit more about what you think is actually happening. Well, the it's not a conspiracy theory to say that the Fed is owned by big Wall Street banks, right? So the, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, they're primary interest is to serve moneyed interest in the United States. Uh, for many different uh, chairmanships, you know, going back to, I would say, Alan Greenspan and then Bernanke and, and Yellen, these were all people in the globalist camp. And so they would go out there and save the ECB. They would do all of these swap lines and, and stuff like that. They would, they would really try to rescue the global economy. But something changed very recently. And Powell, I think, is under different direction now to play hardball with the globalists. And um, th this is moneyed interest in the United States versus these globalists that are represented by neocons in the United States, as well as Democrats, and all of the ruling power pe uh, people in power over there in the European Union. These are all globalist uh, uh, politicians. So that's, that's where I see this dynamic is... The globalists are trying to, I mean, with these sanctions and stuff, they're really shooting themselves in the foot. They're pushing this ESG stuff that's that's going to crash the economy. And so the moneyed interest in the United States are like, we've had it. We're done playing with these globalists and we're going to uh, take care of US first. This is another, uh, not a MAGA thing, but it's, it's an America first strategy that the Fed is starting to uh, personify, I think. All right. Well, let, let's continue on. Um, I know that uh, this is something that we've been tracking a long time here as well. Um, but last week, there was also a pretty big meeting of these quote unquote globalists. Um, you know, this Davos meeting, uh, it was very, very interesting. I noted this, the difference between Davos and Oslo Freedom Forum held by the Human Rights Foundation that kind of happened at the exact same time. Ansel, you have a couple of different things that you wanted to talk about from Davos. Uh, let's jump into that. Yeah, another, this is just a real quick uh, statement here or, or uh, update on what came out of Davos because um, we talked last week was the history of Davos. So we went through a lot of that history. If you guys haven't seen that episode, you guys can go back and check that out as well as two episodes ago with Tom Luongo, we talked a lot about Davos. Um, but so this is just kind of to close the loop on this. Um, the big story I, I, saw that was in relation to the Bitcoin industry, at least over the last couple of days, was that um, a bunch of these big banks said that they see, they're on a panel, and they said that they see a, a CBDC replacement for SWIFT coming within five years. Um, I think it's, it's just a fundamental misunderstanding of what CBDCs do. They're not a replacement. SWIFT is just a messaging system. Um, so I, I 
I think it's funny that the one big headline that I saw coming out about CBDCs is just a complete misunderstanding of uh, what a CBDC is, what SWIFT is. It's almost like they're they're reaching out and they're trying to come up with a narrative for for a reason to pursue CBDCs. Um, and so that was the main headline there. The other headline that I thought was interesting in relation to macro, because I think the, the biggest macro story that's affecting a lot of these commodity prices and a lot of the uh, 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 consumer confidence and, and inflation expectations and all of that uh, right now is the, the war in Ukraine. Uh, Kissinger, Henry Kissinger, a uh, very famous uh, politician from the United States, you know, going back to Nixon and all that. Um, he came out and said that Ukraine should sue for peace, that we should just end this and get this over with. Uh, Ukraine is lost. There's no reason to continue down this road. And that really kind of exploded a lot of people's narratives about this. And it made people think that perhaps the end of this market disruption um, is is close. So um, yeah, I, I just wanted to bring up those two things out of Davos. Do you have any comments or any favorite stories that you saw out of Davos? I want to dive into the Kissinger thing a little bit more. I mean, I, I guess before we do that, let's talk about CBDCs. On this show, we've been talking about how CBDCs are really not going to be that big of a deal. I, I doubt that they're really going to ship uh, in, in, in any meaningful way. Like obviously China is doing tests with a large portion of their population. But in terms of like these things actually becoming adopted, we, we've been skeptical here. Uh, we, we definitely are much more... Uh, bullish on the idea of dollar stable coins becoming proliferating and becoming very, very relevant. We've been very skeptical of CBDC. So uh, again, it's interesting to see the Davos crew, uh, the globalists talking and continue to push CBDCs. Europe is grasping for air, grasping for straws with the CBDC narrative and the the uh, the CBDC, the Euro uh, CBDC. Um, but Ultimately, again, like you said, they're just looking for a reason to continue to pursue this. And the only reason that they that these things exist is to surveil. That's the only reason that a CBDC is better than the existing system is that it gives them the ability to surveil uh, more, uh, you know, more than they can right now, potentially. Um, going on to Kissinger and Davos, like I want to tease that out a little bit more. Like, can you you, you kind of mentioned the fact that Kissinger was a big part of you know, foreign policy with, uh, with Nixon, but, you know, you kind of failed to mention that he was integral in establishing the Euro dollar system and the deal with the Saudis, yeah. uh, to, to support the dollar and tether it to oil. Um, you know, this is someone who, you know, has impacted all of our lives in an enormous way, every person on the planet. Uh, so when they're coming out and they're speaking about the situation in Ukraine, like what's the weight of that? And, like, I guess, so like, what can we read from that other than, you know, maybe that indicates uh, that people can, uh, yeah, I guess I'll send it back to you. Yeah, I mean, Kissinger is super well respected. And one thing that I've noticed over the last, um, I would say, five years, you know, going into the, through coronavirus and, and into this, the current crisis that we're seeing today, um, there is a lack of statesmanship. There's a lack of leadership. In a lot of these, in a lot of these situations, and there, there's also just a lack of planning. Uh, there, there seem the EU seems to be lashing out in many directions, uh, in sanctions and and other things of uh, seizing uh, money that's held in in Western banks uh, for Russia. I mean, they're just lashing out. There do doesn't seem to be a like a very well thought out plan. And Kissinger is kind of the opposite of that. Okay. He is a very long-term thinker, very big planner. Uh, he sees the big picture better than the current generation of statesmen out there. And so when he, when he says this, I think it really shook a lot of people. It shook a lot of people uh, thinking that uh, what is the direction they're going to take on you on Russia and what's the end of this war? Because you know, people like von der Leyen from Europe, they said, we're going to fight to the last Ukrainian. Well, now Kissinger's coming out and saying, oh, well, maybe we should think about wrapping this up sooner rather than later. And that makes a lot of people take note of 
you know, what the situation is and maybe make different plans for the future. Instead of thinking oil is going to continue to go up, maybe we already have seen the top of the oil price. And if this Russia-Ukraine situation wraps up sooner rather than later, perhaps oil will come down. So that is a lot of, I think, what's going on here. That's why I thought it was important. Oh, you're muted. I think that these are really good. This is really good information that you're kind of bubbling up and something that's not part of the headlines, but uh, definitely something that listeners need to uh, to keep an eye on. Um, kind of getting on to, again, what I mentioned at the beginning, uh, the the difference between, you know, Oslo and Davos. Um, it was really interesting to see the alignment of, let's call it, the VC-backed altcoin DeFi establishment and their presence at Davos. And then on the contrary, the the Bitcoin focus at the Oslo Freedom Forum, you know, a forum that's talking about how to give dissidents freedom and how to enable them and and relieve them from totalitarians. And then on the flip side, Davos is a conversation about how to control people, how to keep them uh, in a box and how to make sure uh, that they fit in within a specific agenda that's being top down and centrally uh, dictated. Uh, Ansel, I guess, have you been kind of focusing on that? And like, what is that? I guess, like, what does that say more about like this difference between Bitcoin and crypto? Yeah, I mean, I've noticed that for years and years, that has been the main um, kind of, or one of the main um, criticisms of altcoins is that they are scams that are in need of kind of regulator protection in a way. Uh, I think that kind of very well uh, shows that they are being at them being at Davos. Uh, they are reaching out, trying to make friends with the regulators um, where Bitcoin doesn't need to do that. You know, Bitcoin says, I, uh, I am a fundamental change in technology and culture and uh, my my time has come. And so that's the way Bitcoin kind of looks at the world where these altcoins are reaching out there to uh, get regulator support. I, I think this really showed up a lot in recent comments by Vitalik, actually. I don't know how deep you want to get into this, but um, he went out on, on Twitter and had this big, long thread about uh, contradictions in his mind uh, between what he wants to Ethereum to be and what he thinks it will be. And by the end of that thread, I was like, man, he is just really wanting to court some government to pick him up. And maybe that is the European Central Bank. Maybe that's some other central bank. But uh, he wants to become, I think he wants to become um, a CBDC for one of these big central banks. Interesting. So you see Ethereum being subsumed by some central bank. I mean... The, the narrative there is that central banks and countries will be massive stakers in the Ethereum blockchain under proof of stake, uh, which is, I kind of find that to be a hilarious narrative. Although, you know, we do expect that nation states will, will be mining Bitcoin as well and holding Bitcoin as treasury. So uh, I'm not many people are predicting the downfall of nation states completely here. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I read that thread. I read a lot into it. I thought it was a very interesting and, you know, the, the contradiction I find right now with Ethereum is that Ethereum cannot become more quote unquote Bitcoin y, like uh, Vitalik coined it in the actual thread, unless Vitalik leaves. But at the same time, Vitalik can't realize his vision for the protocol unless he stays. So uh, that is the, uh, that is the, uh, the stick there. And, and that's where I think you know, there, there is a lack of hope there for that ecosystem in terms of, uh, you know, achieving the decentralization that we enjoy, you know, on Bitcoin and at Bitcoin. Um, Ansel, I think that's the end of what we got here. Any last words that you want to talk about for this show? Well, I have a couple more charts. Maybe I'll, uh, you know, expand on a different post on Bitcoin magazine in future days. So be watching out for that, or I could put it out on Twitter or both. So, Uh, be watching out for uh, things like the Baltic dry index and freight rates uh, and what we can learn from those things, because I think that's very interesting when you look at uh, the cost of to ship steel or the cost to ship one of those 40 foot containers and perhaps what we can um, 
see or learn uh, by looking at those charts. So uh, be watching out for that. And that's it, man. Thanks for um, having me back on the live stream and good to have you back, Christian. Yeah, absolutely. Y'all don't forget to follow Ansel on Twitter at Ansel Linder. Make sure to go check out Bitcoin and Markets, his amazing newsletter. I know I got everyone who is hosting these live streams hooked on Bitcoin and Markets, and I'm a, I've been a big fan for four or five years now. Uh, and you guys can follow me at CK underscore Snarks. We stream these live every single Tuesday. We drop them as a podcast and an article on Bitcoin Magazine uh, every single Wednesday. So keep up with the latest in macro. Check out FedWatch. Make sure to subscribe to our podcast feed and keep tuning in. Thanks so much for joining us.